Hi folks, I'm Ariel. I'm the QA manager at Extra Games, working on Torchlight 3, and my pronouns are she, her. Hello, my name is Myron Parks. I'm a director of technology, reliability engineering at AppNovation, and my pronouns are he, him. And last, and maybe least, I'm no, Chelsea Kerr. <laughs> <laughs> I'm QA manager at Riot Games, and my pronouns are she, her. Chelsea is secretly our glorious leader. It's true. I can hear you, Chris, but it might you. just be me. There you go. You're not muted anymore. Wow. Myron muted you. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you well, want to say who you are again? Yeah. Just well, so hey. Yourself again. Hello. Reintroducing myself. My name is Chris <laughs> Rando. I am a QA lead at Epic Games, and my pronouns are he, him. Yay. And this is Yay. the QA Underground Podcast. We did it. We did it. <laughs> All we're right. Here. So happy to see everybody this morning. Now, today we're going to be continuing our series of QA Fundamentals, Woo. and we are going to be looking at quality bars. So establishing quality bars can help set standards for the development team to measure their project against, helping to ensure that everyone involved is a champion for quality. And we're a huge fan of quality around here. Yeah, I don't know about <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wanted to start with like a, a quick little like teaser. I just I want you all to just think about this. And what is your the quality bar that you are like absolutely ride or die for? Like this is the one that you will go to bat always and forever. This is my thing. We need to hit this. Who wants to start with that one? Okay, so I'll start because okay. I think <laughs> I have one <laughs> that I mean it honestly it may not be the most pivotal one but for me it seems to be the easiest one to motivate folks but it is having the quality bar of knowing our low mid and high spec mm. and and what's important with those to me has been very helpful and the reason why it, it's helpful is because it allows us to make categories of performance allows us to understand what hardware we need to buy it helps us know what the business finds to be important so like I said, it may not be the most pivotal quality bar, but understanding our men's spec, um, you know, at the very least, mm. the men's spec is important. Oh, excellent. I'd say that the, the one that is most important to me, is, and it can kind of vary from game to game, um, <clears throat> is making sure that the uh, core loop of the game is functional. Um, at, at the at the very least, like you need to be able to do all the things to go through the loop of like, you know, like I go out and I do quests and I get loot and I take that loot back and I sell it and then I get more quests and then I go out and do more quests like that. Mm. Just core loop of the game needs to be functional because if any point of it breaks, the whole game falls apart. Mm -hmm. um, and a part of that can be making sure that like the basic progression of of your content works um because otherwise the core loop will work up until a specific point and then it'll, it'll it'll hit a wall um so that tends to be like one of the things that i'm making sure i look at like on just about every single potential release is is at least the core loop and hopefully the full progression but yeah absolutely that, time. yeah that golden path awesome no that's a good one wow there's already some good ones myron top it off what you got yeah so <laughs> So this is this is targeted at um, uh, software in general, but mm. but I like to look for an effective or or a dope team. And what that means, I think the entire process of <laughs> I said process process. Um, it's like I, sometimes like Kiwi's it. Playhouse in here, where I feel like the secret <laughs> word gets said. <laughs> Our secret word every week is process. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw oh, the giant Lord. chair like <laughs> Yeah. Uh, can so I get, like, can I be cherry? 
<laughs> so, so, so like I, I, I see like the the entire process of, of what we do to get from a, sort of like the inception of the of whatever we're trying to do to when we actually launch it as a learning exercise. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking for symbols that the team knows enough to support it when it goes live. So I want to be at the point where it takes less than a day to resolve bugs on average, like bugs that occur anywhere. Um, that's the quality bar that I look for before I give, uh, before I like lean in and say, yeah, I think we're ready to go. Um, mm-hmm. We need to be able to, as a team, resolve problems within a day. Um, that tells me that we're ready to support this thing when it goes live. Oh, that's good. Wow. That's a good one. That's a really good one. Excellent. Very, very meta. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I would say I'm, I'm very meta about these things. Probably, that's a theme, I would say. You probably see that. Oh, that's awesome. Can't confirm. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, tend to, I tend to be the kind of person that, that is definitely on the uh, what is the minimum spec kind of kind of thing. Like, what are we making this for and can we ensure that the people using those platforms are going to actually have the best enjoyment out of it like that's the one where i'm just like no this doesn't work on what we said it can work on we got to fix this yeah that, that's mine where i push hard i when actually I used- found that the switch is great for this uh yeah. at least recently <laughs> like if you're trying to ship on consoles and uh the the, the switch is a is a great console don't get me wrong but it, mm. it tends to be like a little lighter in terms of its hardware strength oh, yeah. so we've we've been kind of using it as a litmus test for are we performative in general is well how does it look on the switch right <laughs> <laughs> yep no that's that's real i remember when that thing came out like that was a that was a journey to kick something on that machine <laughs> my goodness i'm glad you said that <laughs> yeah all right i thought you were gonna say windows 10 like see if it runs on windows 10 with the latest <laughs> update. with, Man, with, with the nice the latest updates y'all nothing works 2080 ti uh, i mean i'm just takes <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude like <laughs> i had to reboot my computer i was like chelsea i have to reboot my computer and she was just like i know <laughs> like, it's, it's like annoying, accepting, you know. Yes, you do. You do. <laughs> I'm just gonna do it just to join you in solidarity. <laughs> Not now. Just wait. Wait until this no, episode's wait. over. Wait a little bit. Quality uh, quality bar is being able to finish this episode, y'all. There it is. Okay, there you go. so okay. we've established our quality bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, real quick, uh, Lady Odd Duck uh, asked a question for you, Myron. I'm curious if that quality bar also speaks to the severity slash complexity of issues you're finding at that point. I would say, yeah, because I look at the average across all the bugs that we're seeing at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I so I actually borrowed in like normal software, I borrowed um, the idea of certification mm. from from the, the gaming industry. Mm-hmm. I found that from a language perspective, people like when you say we have to stop everything and do regression, people are like, ew. But when you say I have to stop everything for certification, yep. like the camera like pants <laughs> tight on your mouth and you talk in slow motion, <laughs> and everyone all of a sudden understands, yeah, we gotta, we have to certify that this stuff works together. Um, so I look across during certification, I look across all aspects of the application, uh, and look at the average across all the bugs that we're finding. Ooh, I found that that. All, there are assumptions in there, of course. It's not perfect, yep. but but you get a good sense for, like, and you have to kind of watch the team, too. So, like, it goes into, like, the agile coaching space where you have to, like, kind of watch the team solve problems as well. And if they're communicating well, they're, if they're a dope team and they're they're solving those problems within a day or so, you're, you're ready. You're, you're never going to be readier because there's things that are going to happen but most importantly, you need to understand that the team knows what the application does um, and, and can solve it. They, they drill for it. It's almost like in the military, like the reason that you drill together is so that when like there's a fire in the next room, everyone knows how to move into like you like have a, a sense about how people move through space mm-hmm. when you're tight with a team. Mm-hmm. 
and you just go do the right things together. It's kind of like that concept. Yeah, it becomes very instinct. meta. Yep. Very meta. It becomes yeah. instinct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've I've tended to look at in, instead of um, like how fast are we fixing bugs, but uh, not not only that, but how how many are coming in, and are, and just generally speaking, are we able to keep keep up with them? Are we like adding more bugs to the pile of things we need to fix than we are actually able to keep up with? Mm. And then once once you hit the point where like oh you're like okay well now we're actually keeping up with it that's when you can like project when you'll potentially be able to be ready um which i find pretty useful <laughs> no no that's awesome all right so with all this discussion should we should we jump right in with another one of these uh patented presentations Y'all, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, hate, I hate being this person. <laughs> no. I love that you are amazing. this person. Yes. I love that you're this person. <laughs> Me too. The self-loathing is real for everyone who doesn't want to watch a uh, <laughs> presentation in the morning. <laughs> so, um, Chris, why don't you kick me off and tell me what we're looking for today? So today we're, we want to look, let's kick it off and start with, um, let's just, what does it mean to establish a quality bar? Like what, are, what is this? We've established a quality. We've talked about what our quality bars are for like our ride or die. We will die on that hill. We will, we want this to happen. We've talked about what our quality bar for this episode is. So why don't we really make a clear definition of what does this mean? What are we doing here? Making a quality bar. So before we get, uh, get there, I want to give Ooh. us an important part of framing. Because I think that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, and so the important thing about quality bars is <clears throat> that they work for your team. They're not for you. They're not for your QA process. They serve your team. They don't serve QA. Um, so mm -hmm. quality bars, even if, though they have one word shared uh, between our titles, they're not for us. Uh, it's just like metrics. Metrics are generally also not for us either. We can use them. But Sounds for similar team. to our previous episode about test plans too. Also a thing, <laughs> right? Mm. Uh, so we're the ultimate communicators on the team. Producers may say that they are, but I'm going to take that title from them right now. And I'm going to say... <laughs> okay. um, Snag it. QA people are actually, uh, well, all right, we'll share it. I'll be nice. Uh, we're, Very generous. We, are, <laughs> we work as a team for communication. We are helping communicate things that perhaps other folks don't know how to measure or communicate. And so this is the first step. Like, make sure your quality bars work for your team's timing. Make sure your quality bars work for your team's process. Make sure your quality bars work for your team's give a shit meter. <laughs> I like that. Um, <laughs> I I've found that this is this can be one of the most common like disagreements that I've had on a project with other disciplines is just like what is the other what is the quality bar because sometimes like whether or not the a game is like ready to release or ready to ship depends on on having this pretty well defined and. So, like sometimes I, I think that generally speaking, people don't disagree that the quality bar has been needs to be met and it's important mm -hmm. that we meet it so much as they might just have wildly different quality bars. And yes. and that can like really kind of prevent you from coming to an agreement on whether or not you're ready. Well, I'm going to show you today how I have approached making sure that everyone knows. Ooh. So stick around because I'm going to show it to you. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why don't y'all like Ariel and Myron, y'all have kind of said what you think a quality bar is. Um, mm. I'll go ahead and throw out that I think a quality bar is anything that the team wants to measure that allows us to say go or no go. No, that's good. Having that yeah. definitive like black and white go or no go like we are. It's if we don't hit this, we're not going anywhere. This stays until we hit that bar. And if we can't hit that bar, we need to do something about that. And if it doesn't matter whether we hit that bar or not, guess what? It's not a quality not bar. It. That's not it. <laughs> yep. Ooh, not it. <laughs> yep. Ariel, Myron, any thoughts there? I, I think I think uh, that that's spot on right there. I uh, when we were talking about test plans, I remember saying how. I would put things in a test plan. Like if the date was promised, I would put everyone is alive on this date. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write entry criteria, exit criteria, expected results, actual results. 
I'm not going to write out those things because they're not, they don't matter. Uh, like a promise is the thing that's the quality bar in that case. So I'm going to expose that to the entire product team. Um, but if we actually do have, here's something that we need to be able to do. We need to make sure that our promoter score or the experience that people have when this goes out mm -hmm. is good. Yep. And, and that if there is an issue or when there are issues, we can fix it really quickly. Uh, boom. Okay. That's, that's the level of quality that we have. Um, anything else is, uh, is, is uncivilized. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I thought about the Grey Poupon. The Grey Poupon commercial oh, just hit Is me. that where that's from? <laughs> yeah. I think so. I think so. Do you have any Grey Poupon? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Y'all, I don't know what's going on in this episode today, but all of us are. It's real good. I love we're, it. We're in a silly mood. Um, <laughs> I, I would also add that like there there is a little bit of gray area when it comes to whether or not you've met a quality bar or not because even if you don't know any reasons why you haven't met a quality bar, there might be things that you know you need to do and check to determine whether or not you've met it that you haven't done. Um, so sometimes like when I'm talking to stakeholders about a quality bar, I might have to clarify like, hey, I currently don't know of any cases where we're not meeting our quality bars, but there's these sets of tests and these sets of things that I would like to look at before I can say for sure. So at the end of the day, like, you know, we we might not give a, a sort of go, no go uh, uh, kind of permission on, on when it comes to this kinds of things just because. You know, we don't have the full information, but uh, I, I see a part of our job as, as QA is to give as much information as we have. And sometimes that includes saying we don't actually know if we've met it. We just don't know that we haven't. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Yes. Yeah. So we're talking about the team aligning on quality bars. So. Why don't we move to see the, how these quality bars apply to the entire team as a whole? Sure. So uh, what are quality bars or how do quality bars apply to my team? Mm -hmm. So let's let's start with the basics, right? They can exist mm -hmm. in several ways and depend on the life cycle of each project. And they should, should, yes, they definitely, I say should, that's a shitty word in QA. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they will change over time. Mm. And uh, with the most stringent requirement wins. So they really need to be thought of by each department. They're, uh, when I say that, yeah, I'm curious wanna, what you mean by that. <laughs> like, do you wanna, mean like each like QA, we make our quality bars, production makes their quality bars and et cetera, engineering. Yes, yes. And, yes. Okay, and we all like come together and be like, here's our quality bars and then establish the project quality bars from there? Yes, so we have many different ways of looking at this, but mm -hmm. what I think is most important is that quality is owned by the people who know what quality means to them. Mm -hmm. So let's take an engineering quality bar, for instance. Uh, that unit tests are established and we have X percentage of coverage. QA is not going to double check on unit test coverage. We're going to say engineering needs to build a process which upholds that being the case. Uh, we also can have kind of distinct product quality bars of acceptance criteria, definition of done, definition of ready are included on every single uh, user story, for instance. Those things are okay. You can have basic process quality bars as well because mm. you can iterate on those over time. Right. So uh, maybe we aren't in a position where everything can have acceptance criteria right now, but we want to get to that phase eventually. It's okay if we iterate on our process and our quality bars as well. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is give each department or discipline ownership over what matters to them. Art assets should have a material system created by X date or whatever. That's fine. Also, quality bars, uh, if you can't see the slide, if you're listening, I'm going to describe what's going on here. But we have several different ways of looking at quality bars as well. And you need to pick the one or the several that work for you. So I have product level quality bars. They're quality bars that we universally accept as the bar for our product at all times. 
So are these, mm. so these are the bars then that, um, these should be immovable. Like these should be, would these be more like solid concrete, not going anywhere? Or are these also still adjustable? They are still adjustable, but I'll tell you where the variable is. So our first example is we fix all priority one, two, and three bugs within three sprints. Okay. Maybe earlier in our development process, when we're in before pre-production, when we're even maybe in just like the the find the fun phase of things, mm -hmm. we may only fix priority one bugs. And that's because priority one bugs will tend to be build breaking or prohibitive. You may call them blocker bugs. You may call mm -hmm. them critical bugs, whatever you call them. Your top priority bug may be the only thing that you fix early in the project. As we get longer term into the project, that quality bar is going to get more stringent because mm -hmm. we believe that we don't want to release maybe priority two or three or majors or even minors to the mm -hmm. public. So as we move on, these products, they are immovable in the sense that every single sprint and or development team or pod or whatever you've got going on has to apply to these. So that's what product means when we're talking about this level. We're talking about we as an entire team have said, this is the quality bar. And the other one I've got is we have X percent of unit functional automated test coverage, right? That's, uh, that is us as a quality team or as an engineering team mm -hmm. saying, this is the minimum bar. You may exceed it at any point in time. So again, these are, ex these are, these are minimums. Mm. Oh, that's a good way to look at it. Like this is a minimum. We have to at least do this. Yes. Feel free to go above and beyond. Yes. That's great. But yep. it, we have to do at least this or else we've got some problems and we need to reassess and discuss things. Yep. I have milestone level listed here too. And I think that this tends to be the thing that we actually think about the most in game QA because we're always trying to hit that next milestone. Mm -hmm. And that would be the quality bar that we accept as the go condition for a milestone of several features. So what we've done actually innately in game QA is made quality bars through go, no go processes. But what we're doing is we're generally allowing the production folks to facilitate that conversation. If we change this to be a, um, a, a systematic approach, a very measured approach, there really isn't a facilitation other than a conversation of us looking down the list of our quality bars and saying we're ready to go. So this is an improvement on speed when it comes to milestones. Lastly, and if we look at this as like circles, concentric circles, we're in the smallest circle right now. So this mm -hmm. is the pod level usually, and this is the feature um, quality bar. And this is the, the thing that we accept as the go condition for a release of a feature. So a feature usually wraps up. It's not usually its own release. It might be. It just depends. But what I would say is if you use feature as a big meta thing, like for instance, um, Astroneer just put out a big feature for automation. But I would imagine probably within their development teams, they may actually have smaller pods who are working on stuff. Mm -hmm. I would say look at the pod level and whatever you call that, like I call it features because I'm from software originally and my teams yeah. also then call it features. But whatever it is, it's satisfaction score, it's a run book, it's whatever. But this is where our test plans come in because usually this is where our test plans rule. We've already made quality bars by ha having test plans. We're here. You got it. You've already got it. So that is the general gist. Thoughts, feels? Yeah. It's dope. I, 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 like, I like how, you know, like it continues to be a conversation. Um, one of the realities too is that when you have quality bars and you go to that go-no-go no go meeting, and you have the stakeholders there, one of the things that you're doing throughout is you're making sure that everyone understands what the quality bars mean, and most importantly, what the risk is of not doing that. And so there's some times where something has to go out. And you sit and you run down the list and you go, okay, all right, <clears throat> do we need to put more people on on production side? Uh, do we need to put this in the, uh, the release notes? Do we need to manage uh, send to the community team to stay ahead of it and maybe like turn it into a joke or, or, or whatever? Like there, there's things that you get to do because you understand as a team how you're going to work together uh, to get this thing out. And when it's out there, 
there's a general understanding. It's all, it's a, again, it's almost like that drilling uh, muscle, like you know how to move together. Mm-hmm. It's not an emergency because the things are known and understood, um, especially in when we're taking risks. Right. We promised um, early access August, so let's do it. Uh, and in the release, the release notes for early access are getting more and more transparent a- as a result. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, like uh, I remember uh, Prison Architect uh, when they first <laughs> came to uh, Earth. That was a legendary early access video. Like, 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 like they they basically named game breaking bugs a feature <laughs> in that video. Uh, and and, and it, but it worked. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that sold it. <laughs> like you get to do stuff like that when the team is aligned, uh, and like, it, 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 I'll just I'll just leave that example for for the history. That's a great one. That's an excellent example of just embracing. Like, look, here's what's going on. This is a feature. Jump in for some early access. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it so much. And I also like uh, just really driving home the fact of iteration and improving upon and ad- adjusting these quality bars as they go and having the entire team bought into that yeah, um, and being willing to adjust their own quality bars uh, to accommodate. Like that's super important. Like if, yeah, I think that's the end of my thought. Yep. That's it. I don't think y'all asked for advice, but I'm going to give you some right here. Yes. Ooh, I love <laughs> passionate <laughs> advice. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm going to I'm going to drive this home again because I think if you take home something from today, take home this phrase. The quality bars aren't worth being quality bars if no one cares. Therefore, if if you care about something, make someone else care about it. Mm-hmm. Um you know, make sure they pick what matters to them. Same thing goes for metrics. Again, I already said this, but I want you to take this away. We don't have quality bars just to have quality bars. We have quality bars because they're meaningful to the process of releasing our product, because they're meaningful to the process of releasing something great. And because at the end of the day, you want to feel good about this. This is the easiest way for people to feel so validated that they did exactly what they were driving to do. If we hit this, if we hit this right, they become minimums, quality bars. They become the thing that we celebrate. We hit all of them. They become the thing that drives having the acknowledgement of accomplishment conversations later. Mm -hmm. You can turn this stuff into really easy awards even. So if you're looking for really great ways to drive points home, to drive accomplishment within your teams, give out silly awards here. Make a quality bar have a top banana award, for instance, for, you know, most bugs smashed or whatever. <laughs> you you can use this to make people care. You just have to do it in the right way. Uh, you don't own measuring the quality bars. I'm going to give you the ability to stand up and fight the system right now because someone's going to say, yeah, but you have quality in your title and you're going to be like, yeah, but it's not my job. And you don't want to sound like that person. <laughs> Ooh, right. Why? This is so, why I want to start negotiating new titles when I get go to new companies. I, I want them. I don't want to be your QA manager. I want to be your risk manager. <laughs> I get it, uh, and it's because we generally get stuff piled on for us. So you don't own measuring the quality bars. You own facilitating the conversation around them. You mm-hmm. own compiling them. I mean, you don't have to own compiling them, but I would say, why not? You need to know what they are because you're going to derive more testing, more quality methodology from this. Mm -hmm. You own the reports and you own holding people accountable to what they've selected. I once had a really long conversation with a producer because they were like, well, Chelsea, why don't you just establish the quality bars? And I'm like, because ultimately you're the one being held accountable. Production is the one being held accountable to whether we meet these quality bars. Mm -hmm. So I have a really... I feel like they have a really big part in owning this part of the conversation. And so we once they understood that, we were able to partner much better because I was like, look, I'm here to help you. But ultimately, if you want this product to be here, I'm here to help you figure out how we get there. I'm here to help you figure out if we are there. I'm not here to figure out measurement methodologies. I'm not here to figure out naming the quality bars. So just a thought. 
Yeah. It's more along the lines of you're here to help enforce and ensure that they're hit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sounds really, uh, you know, don't feel like you're taking anything away from yourself by not being the person who measures it. Mm -hmm. Just realize that you have a very big role and that there are prob possibly hundreds of quality bars that you're going to own over the lifetime of this project. So you still have a big burden. Um, so lastly, you know, the last piece of additional unsolicited advice I'm going to give you <laughs> is that you need to approach your quality bars like you do your 90 day plans. If you don't do them, do them. Uh, but you need to, or any goal, they need to be smart E, um, smart goals. Uh, and I added on the I, I'm going to, I'm going to start to use this. So specific, mm -hmm. measurable, achievable, relevant, time-based. And then my secret addition is the I for iterative. And I actually think we need to approach our, our personal and professional goals this way as well. Um, it is okay for you to iterate. If you are not there, like if if it is unfathomable for you to have 100% unit test coverage, which I would never recommend that you do. But anyway, if, if it's unfathomable for that, start at 5%. Start at X level. And one example of this that I've had on my teams is with defect detection effectiveness and defect resolution effectiveness, which we use for, for metrics measurements. I had a team that was at like 0% and then we said, okay, our goal is just going to be to get to 15%. That seems like very small amount, but they hit it and they felt like they crushed it. Yeah. Yeah. And that morale boost can be fantastic. Super big pushing everyone through to, all right, let's get to 25. Let's get to 40. Yes. You know, let's yes. keep going. Let's keep going because we crushed that 15. Yep. So it's okay. It's just like measuring sprint points for um, your sprints. Like mm -hmm. you're going to figure out what your velocity as a team is. Also, it's important that they're iterative because you need to understand if you're not going to hit those goals. Like if 60 frames per second is never going to be a possibility, Let's start to figure it out through normalizing quality goals now. And then we can have we can help facilitate the tough conversation. Like we're pointing out that risk. You know, Ariel made a great point. She wants to be a risk manager. It's a really real thing. You can start to have those really important conversations if we know that we're failing or if we know that we're at risk of not achieving those things. And that's also not saying that we can't using your example, can't hit 60 frames ever but maybe just sure. not right now. Yep. And we kind of pocket that and let's go for 30. Let's try and hit 30 baseline consistently yep. and let's achieve that. Then we can push for 60. The other thing to note is like, because you're not going to be the one measuring them, all of them necessarily, you may need to build tooling around how to get to those quality bars. So what if we don't have a way to measure FPS consistently and cr take a log and get the average and take mm. a look at blips and performance, or we don't have memory leak testing, or we don't have asset validation software for the artists or whatever. Like us allowing ourselves to have iterative quality bars means that we also understand the burden of the technology that we're taking on. Yeah. So we have iterative technology too. Like I, I find myself constantly asking for new tools, even on a project that's two or three years old, right? Um, we literally just had a asked our engineers to give us a tool that we could use to measure uh, bandwidth usage um, because this was not something that we had previously been able to look at. And now mm -hmm. we're like, well, we need to pay attention to how much bandwidth we're using. And in order for QA to do that, we're going to need a tool that lets us do that. 100. Um, yeah. And I was going to say also, like, consider building these things in. So, like, if you see a storyboard and you see the goals of the application, they look really cool. Um, I highly recommend adding a goal named acceptability. I'm sorry, uh, accessibility. Add a goal named quality. Add a goal named performance. Add a goal named security, so that it's built in and it's scored for the 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 amount of effort and capacity it's going to take to build an application that meets the quality bars of your organization, that meets the needs of your clients or your customers. That, that, that takes care of all those things so that it's not something that is that is extra. This is this is amazing, really important work. Um, mm -hmm. I may have given this analogy before, but like a company like Disney, their product is actually quality. 
and I'm pretty sure if I if I like somehow broke into the vault with ninjas uh, of their storyboards, you would see quality as as one of the high level goals of any service or system, and and and, and it's it, you know it's okay, especially to approach the producer or the channel manager or the product manager and ask, hey, well, wh- where are we building? these things into our roadmap like building them into this system Mm. because you don't want to be fighting at sprint planning for time or capacity to Mm -hmm. do these things yeah absolutely a thing i'm also really glad you kind of brought up the idea of categorization because i'm going to tell you that i have a system for that too i swear i didn't pay myron (laughs) I don't believe it. I think you two are working together. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we were. <laughs> Passing notes underneath the table, I swear to God. <laughs> all right, all right. Surprises, flips again. Yay. <laughs> um, I've talked about flips probably, I don't know, like 60% of the time on the show because I'm a real believer in it. Thank you, Jacob Taylor, for, for this system for me. Um, Flurps, again, just if you haven't caught our previous episodes, Flurps is a system that is not unique to me. I didn't make this up. It is a, a common software slash problem solving um, uh, structure. Um, we have slowly started to implement it ac- across many, many, many different Um, arenas from metrics creation to test plans to quality bars. And it's because I've been able to bring this kind of structure in on one thing that now my team is like, oh, let's talk about it being in other places. It becomes common phrasing. And so my team really has taken to it. My development teams have taken to it. The leadership now um, thinks it's a hilarious word and they use it a lot. Um, So uh, the acronyms I've ever heard. I love it. It's very (laughs) satisfying to say. Um, But FLIRPS is functionality, localization, usability, reliability, performance, and supportability. These are categories that you can use to break down the problem. So what I've done is in my quality bars document, I actually include this diagram. And I go through and I also describe each of these categories. So you've got um, this is taken from my slide, from the deck that I use, um, and from the deck that my team uses, but it describes examples of quality bars. And this is setting the frame for people to think about it. Like Myron said, you want to set the framework, the mindset for folks to think about this. So for functionality, for instance, we have no blocker and critical bugs exist. That and is important. Um, All supported platforms have been tested against and pass X percentage of the tests. This is your quality bar. You can measure this one. You should be tracking it. Mm -hmm. Um, X number of game loops have been tested by playtest team and team recommends a go for the milestone. That and, again, really important. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Crossplay between platforms has been assessed by the playtest team and... They are a go for the milestone. So again, these are just some examples of functionality um, quality bars that you could have. I will let you, we will post this. I will give this presentation to Lady Odd Duck um, to post on our social so that everyone has access to it. So if you are listening to this, take a look at our Twitter feed to grab this. We will also link this in Twitch, I'd imagine we can put the link in Twitch so you can just snag it. But there are more examples. So that handles the F, localization. So this is one that people forget about, which is really sad because games are not just for the language that you're working in, right? Mm -hmm. And it should really be an I for internationalization. That is the more common term that you're going to hear flying around the industry. So quick TLDR, the difference between localization and internationalization, and I am not a localization professional, so feel free to blast me for this, um, is internationalization seeks to make all content, visual, um, audible, like text, uh, appear appropriate for an international audience. The best example that I have in the game industry of this is um, Overwatch. They do a really incredible job of internationalizing. Mm -hmm. If you go to some of their maps, their maps are 
consistent with the cultural themes of the the place. So it's not just localized into a different language. Right. It actually has a appearance that is consistent with what we would expect of that location. Oh, so, okay. All right. That's a good good description of it. All right. I was so, having trouble yeah. there. <laughs> Localization is usually just the mechanics of translating. So that's the difference. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's audio um, or text, localization is purely focused on getting it into the right language. So there's a, a difference there of linguistics versus total content representation mm -hmm. that internationalization rep represents. So let me give you, let me let me try to give an example. Um, so like if you were trying to make something for like the French speaking aud audience in Par in in France, you wouldn't use like uh, like in an example, you wouldn't use like the Paris uh, hotel in Las Vegas that has the Eiffel Tower. You would actually use like La Tour Eiffel uh, en Paris, like like it actually build it that way. Whereas yes. like us, just like English speakers from like North America, we'd be like, oh, I mean, that's basically an Eiffel Tower. It would be cool. You can do all these things, maybe like a zombie board. But like when like the Francophones see it, who are like there, they'd be like, what the? <laughs> yes yes uh it's exactly that like the street the street signs are authentic to the area we're not making a parody or like a, a generalization of it mm -hmm. like um it's okay to have croissants and baguettes uh just you know make them actually authentic looking or well, you know what we're trying to do is really um go beyond the text Mm -hmm. with internationalization but so we've we've digressed because localization also takes on internationalization you can you can substitute an i in here too um just a couple of examples localization producer recommends product as a go for the milestone so again this is the idea that they own localization production owns the status of saying go for the milestone you don't uh percent of strings have been localized in y languages so X strings have been localized in Y languages. That's good. We need to know that. Like that is definitely a quality bar, but I definitely have seen teams kind of fudge on this before at many places. Oof. Um, That's sad. <laughs> it, it, it is, <laughs> right? Um, to go into the more of the internationalization, all regions have listed their acceptance criteria for release. We tend to think about this as like, um, just ratings driven, but really this could be everything from blood and guts and bones yeah. to um, do we have specific bandwidth? You know, Ariel mentioned bandwidth, but like there, there are definitely bandwidth limitations for different areas of the world. And so regions may have different ideas of what is important and appropriate for a specific place. Not everybody gets free bandwidth. We're very lucky here mm -hmm. in North America or in America to get unlimited bandwidth on most providers. Um, and our, our phone data is very cheap as well. It's not that way everywhere. We also don't have PC cafes very common here. That may also be a thing, right? So, um, you know, this is why localization is important and that we establish quality bars. We may have to build systems, literal networking systems to handle mm -hmm. this. We may have to build pipelines for handling content. We may need to establish relationships with vendors for translation, for art assets, for consulting for international uh, understand uh, understanding international um, right. limitations. Yeah. Right? Really important. And this one very, very commonly goes, sadly, um, a little under underrepresented. So to our localization brethren, because they're often very often grouped with QA, we love you and we want you to be represented here. Next up is our usability. Ooh. Uh, I think that this is one where QA really loves, like we, we tend to favor this one a whole lot, totally understandable, right? Um, we, we think about regression test cases uh, so all regression test cases have run and result in no issues of severity X or higher. Why is that usability? Well, because if you have severity X or higher, severity, not priority. So this mm -hmm. is different from functionality. Severity is the usability of the system for the user. So we really need to take the usability side. So severity. Design review has occurred. Our friends in design love it when we ask them if they're good to go, <laughs> right? Design review has occurred and the design lead is a go. Again, this isn't yours to measure. 
this is just checking in with with our with our family, our development family. Yeah, Are we good. Like going around with your checklist, I mean, like design, you feeling all right? Cool. Production, how do you feel? Cool. Engineering, yep. yeah. All right. Oh, wait. Engineering. Uh oh. Let's talk. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Wireframes for Feature X have been completed, reviewed, revised, and approved. I love this one. Mm -hmm. Wireframes are so wonderful. They help you really hold your team accountable later. So, you know, make sure you're looking at that. And then Myron mentioned NPS, Net Promoter Score, earlier. Um, Player Lab has occurred with an NPS of blank, right? Just a couple of examples. Take a look. I have a lot more here. But usability is one where I think this is what QA people, this is humans using human brains. Mm. usually in usability. Yep. So we can come up with some really cool stuff here. Yeah. All right, reliability. This one is probably our most neglected child. I mean, I may have said that about <laughs> localization, but <laughs> <laughs> well, for really real though. But for really reals though, it's reliability. These poor and children. It, <laughs> um, it's because Reliability mm -hmm. is frequently something that we take a very hard line late in the process on, right? We talk about yeah. quality service uptime when we're a live product. We don't talk about quality service uptime when we're a pre-production product, and mm. we should. Uh, we don't talk about on-call. Our ops friends will figure that out. No, we need to talk about it now because we need to staff based on what that looks like. Yeah, uh, good point. monitoring good lord why do we wait so long to put monitoring into place for projects i don't know but we should talk about it now because we may need to have a contract with someone we definitely oh, we will need to engineer something what do you mean oh, we by purchased that? Splunk and service now though <laughs> that <Do> we really <laughs> <laughs> dude that okay <laughs> Um, okay, so mo <laughs> monitoring is the ability for us to have an monitoring and alerting are the ability mm -hmm. for us to see the usage of our systems and know when there's a problem. Oh, okay. So it could be sim as simple as transactional information between internal databases to external monitoring of calls to our services, players Got in it. game, um, concurrency, that kind of thing. We want to mm -hmm. monitor that stuff. But that's not all we want to monitor. I don't I don't want to be called every time a system takes a restart. And in some systems, if we don't put in enough monitoring, I will mm -hmm. literally get called every single time there's a blip, even though it could be a very recoverable, restartable thing. Right. Um, our our player support friends here are really important. So so talk to player support about reliability. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk to your operations groups about reliability. They will love you for having this conversation early because they are so often late in the process. And we have the ability as quality to establish great relationships with them today. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question about this one as well, the reliability? Yeah. Uh, is this also the point where you engage your pro gamer community, like your in, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be. So one thing to note about this is there's not, I'm not going to come after you if you put something in reliability that should be in usability or performance or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you should talk to people. Speedrunners, great for reliability. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't matter where you put something, just think about it and put it and agree with the team. But yeah, programmers for sure would be a great spot for here. Okay. All right, we're almost there. We have two more. Performance. Journey. This one is my favorite. And the reason why it's my favorite is this one tends to be the easiest to um, just snag numbers for. This is like numbers, numbers, numbers. It's mm. also the easiest thing to automate quite frequently, but it is very often underrepresented and under underprogrammed against in some groups. And it's because we don't think about it until too late. And then there's spaghetti everywhere and all over the place. And people <laughs> like, I don't know what yeah, to do. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. I think it was just VR becoming big like four or five years ago and working on VR projects where I actually saw performance being a thing that was taken care of from the beginning of the project. Because yeah. if you dipped even a little bit too much below 
90 frames per second, people were getting seriously ill. <laughs> Even though they start falling out. <laughs> I... like, for real. Like, that's just, like yeah. people rebooting. Like, people just like, ugh. <laughs> it's like getting vomit, like having to sit down, having to like take the headset off, and, like sit over a trash bucket. Like, for real. Like, for real. if you were not paying attention to performance right from the beginning, the dev team was just getting seriously sick. <laughs> I remember having to hire and and talk with people with strong constitutions for for yep. VR games initially. It was uh, <laughs> nope because you have them do I, the spin test that they have astronauts do just to make sure they're well, up to it. Seriously, it's a thing. <laughs> Interview questions: Have you yeah. ever worked at a carnival? Have you ever cleaned vomit? What happened to you? <laughs> yeah, I happened to work at a carnival and I cleaned vomit. So back then, I had to like clean all the vomit, but when my games or my immersed <laughs> VR uh, is not working really well, my wife will get a headache and be done for the day, and I'll be like, "Oh, that was, that was unpleasant." So I luckily don't get shut down by it. But yeah, I definitely. I'm knocking do. on wood. I'm knocking on wood. No, I'm I'm there with you. Like I'm one of the ones that that's why I could test like multiple VR games in a row because I have that constitution to sit through it. But there are a lot of people that don't. And I'm so glad that Chelsea, you're mentioning how performance is something that is brought in last. That's why I agreed with you at the top of the episode about min spec stuff. Like we have to nail these things and yep. keep in mind from the beginning. Yep. Oh, and one pro tip that I that I found: uh, if you can't get capacity to build tools for uh, to hook into the system, to frankly build a system that can be maintained afterward performance and like blowing the entire server uh infrastructure down is the perfect time for you to be able to buy some capacity to build hooks into your system like like no one will will just give you extra capacity when there aren't problems but when you bring the entire database down sometimes you can get some additional <laughs> capacity sometimes to build extra tools <laughs> so like this pro tip like you can get some things done you know, even in this latest stage, uh, even though this should be done throughout, mm -hmm. but typically this latest stage, you can get some things, maybe not for this release, but for the next one. Like, yep. hey, while you're while you're in there. <laughs> so I, I wanted to jump in and talk a little bit about like why it can be so important to talk about performance really early on. Um, so one of the things that can happen if you wait until the very end is you'll have discovered that the entire game has been built um, with a lot of assumptions about what like level of of like things happening on the screen that the game is actually capable of doing, right? So if you mm -hmm. get to the end of of your production process, if you get like close to to going to to beta or or close to alpha or whatever, and you realize like, oh, we have all of these things that we're doing that require a much like uh, more performative machine and they just totally tank performance on these lower end machines, suddenly you're going to have to go back and not just like kind of make systemic changes to try and improve the performance, but you're probably going to have to change a lot of your content, right? Like yeah. maybe a lot of those skills that shoot out a bunch of missiles, they just can't shoot out as many missiles as they used to because it's just, yeah. it, it's not as performative. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to like jump in and make these kinds of assessments early on prevents you from having to go back and redo a bunch of work later on that you would actually be better off spending on polish. Absolutely. Two, um, two, two examples, Crisis and <laughs> Sega Genesis game system. I don't know if you ever played Sega Genesis, but there oh, were oh, yeah. plenty of games. You do the slow motion thing. And of course, Crisis is being redone now for modern hardware. Mm -hmm. And it, like even the top shit can't run it now. So, <laughs> so they're oh, they're man. lowering how intensive it is to make it better for modern modern hardware, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, it's true. It's true. Oh. <laughs> and I think like <laughs> Myron made the point of professional gamers. Uh, this is a great place to start to talk to pros about what they expect here too. Um, you know. It's load testing. It's not just memory usage. It's mm -hmm. not just database usage. It's input lag. It's all mm -hmm. kinds of things. So again, if none of that stuff matters to your team, if you're not making a live product, for instance, 
then you just have different performance metrics and that's okay. We're all going to have different ones, but you need to have this conversation early because you need to figure out how you're going to measure it. Yeah. Not all of us have access to picks, for instance, right? Like, exactly. (laughs) Uh, to, To get serious for a note, when I, you know, when I talk to my team, when I talk to the, the DevOps engineers, I talk about performance being an architectural uh, piece when we're looking at verification and validation. Um, and so framing it in that way, uh, people understand that this is the bones, this is the scaffolding of your system or, or of your house. Mm-hmm. So you should be thinking about performance when you're building the architecture of your system, similar to security, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. You know, another note that I want to make really quickly is with mobile devices, performance becomes way, way, way more important. Um, And performance takes on a different term. It's the heat of the battery. It's the battery Mm. usage. It's memory usage. You know, we we talked about these things, but uh, modern personal computers have a a near unlimited bandwidth. We've got Stadia and things like that, which are coming um, to be more popular which are incredible because they allow you to not think about things like hardware limitations as much. But the the shifts just happen in different places, right? It's server capacity. It's all those kinds of things. So just think about what you're developing for. And let's say you're going to be developing across multiple platforms. Just make sure you have this conversation early. If you're having a cross-platform Um, cross-play situation, you need to have these conversations really early because you don't want people to fry their phones. You don't want people to literally uh, start their phone on fire a la, Mm -hmm. you know, Samsung Note, whatever it was. Like, those are things that we just don't want to do, right? Yeah. All right. We're moving on. We've got one left. Let's finish this circle. (laughs) Circle of flirps. (sighs) Supportability. This one's hard because this one is once you're live, usually this one is when the problems happen. Usually Um, this is this is kind of abstract. So here are some ideas. Usage reporting has been implemented. Can you find out how much your players are playing? Can you find out how much they're using? This isn't server usage for you. This is supporting the players, the times that they need the types of things that they're doing. This is a rollback plan exists in case you really screw things up. You need to be able to support a problem. If you can never roll back, you need to know that because you're going to be doing a redeploy. And that means you need to be fast at that Mm -hmm. if you can't roll back. Can I add one thing here too? Absolutely. Uh, For your rollback plan, you need to make sure that whoever is facilitating, like, like, you know, commanding, as it were, the the release that they're that they have the they have the stones and the support from leadership uh, or the they have the the they have the um they have the fortitude and the support from the entire leadership team to actually call the rollback because that's that's a that's a hard moment where it's one person against 10 people that really really i just needed five more minutes i'll do it um you got to be willing it's got to be a real rollback plan, mm-hmm. in other words. Yeah, that kind of like marking, like, if we get to this point, this person needs to make the call, and when that call, or the, this group needs to make the call, and when that call's made, here's how we're going to go forward. Yeah, it's automatic. Yep. Automatic. So, take a look at these. There's some really good ones here. We should noodle more on this. All right, now I'm going to show you the actual thing. So all I've done here is just show you the preamble. So let's talk about what actual quality bars look like. All right, here's an example. I have mobile performance um, test tiers, right? And it's this is specifically devoted to mobile. You can change this to suit whatever you want, GPU, CPU on PC. Mm -hmm. You may even have um, uh, console support here. So you could define what uh, different types of Xboxes you're running on, for instance, and understanding the performance differences because we have you know, several different types of those. So the world is very vast. You need to have the conversation about what your expectations are, right? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Once I do this, I then have a sample slide with a witty name. Ooh. Um, mm-hmm. 
And it's because my quality bars are iterative. So uh, here is my TLDR. I made a slide deck. I put that performance slide. I put all those slides you saw, the circle of flirps before. And then I'm going to tell people what they already know, which is what's in this milestone. And the reason why is because people are going to be like, I forgot what's in this milestone. Mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> but this is just a really quick thing. Like I can play on this environment. We can play in a party. The game client talks to our services. Our game right. loop won't be done. I'm giving a super quick TLDR. If you can't do that, then you're not going to have a good time figuring out what quality is for this. And then I link to the source of truth, right? I link to Jira. After that, I get more in depth. Tell me about what my FPS usage is going to be. Tell me about battery life. You notice that I'm not putting that in the context of flurps. Here, I just want a quick and easy to read chart of what my quality bars are. Mm -hmm. I don't care, right? I just need to see them really quick side by side. And you'll see that I have some notes here because sometimes it's important to tell people how we're measuring this. Startup load time and loading screen time are like very hotly contested things. I don't know why. Well, actually, I do. They're confusing, right? <laughs> but I'm going to give people. I'm going to give people notes here, right? So this is an actual chart in my actual quality bars document that I've made. Next, I'm going to show you what really matters, and that is. Let me reshare. Hold on one second, and and share again. Here's where the money is made, y'all. This is my aggregate quality bars tracker. So the other thing is just for show. Okay. And it's not that it doesn't matter. It's just that it doesn't matter in the same ways. This aggregate quality bars tracker is my team's document to work on. The slide deck that I showed is mine. That is qualities. Mm. That is what I own. This is the teams. This is where they come in. Tis tiny. Yes, okay. I will embiggen. Apologies. <laughs> embiggen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, boop. Here. I hope that's better. All right. So this is an aggregate. This is all of my milestones together. Okay. And it's because I want to... I want a quick look and I want the producers to have a quick look at how we're doing. So right now the team is working on milestone one and we have 5% of things in progress, 72% of them have passed and 22% have that of them have failed. The big deal, mm. right? So now what we can do is go look at that and here are the quality bars. And you'll notice that I give everybody a color because they're going to put their stuff in, right? Okay. So for instance, our services and dependencies group has a list of things that they need to get done. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of people who are working on this. So coordinate for deploying with release managers, parties are working, exit features work, launch can happen in this environment. The reason why those are services and dependencies is because parties is a service. Exiting is a service that we're using. This mm -hmm. feature team may not be creating that for this milestone. So they're looking at a dependency. So it's really important that they know about it. Oh, that's a good call out. Whereas like we have lots of different folks who are doing other things, right? Like mm -hmm. Ellen owns the fact that there are no bugs of a critical or, or higher priority. And this is how she's going to measure it. And we have someone else who's looking at the performance test results. Right. And so everything is color coded and this allows for people to put in what matters to them. No, well, that's very good. And putting the onus on the people who own those sections, being like, hey, here's the color. I need you to fill this out with what you need to be have uh, kept track. What we ugh. I can speak, I promise. Yep. What needs to be kept, what we need to be keeping track of. Yep. And this is your section please upkeep it. I'll come talk to you if it needs some more info. Yep. And you'll Very notice cool. I don't have tabs for everything because we haven't reached there yet. And mm -hmm. we maybe even haven't had the conversation yet about mm -hmm. what those are. So you'll notice that when we, I, I showed that chart 
early on in my test plan. And that's right. because that is the quality bar for um, low, mid, high spec. And then I dive into the project or product level things. And then this is the milestone level. So bigger, smaller, even smaller. So what we want to mm. do is drive that. And as time goes on, I'm basically going to copy this tab to the next milestone. Right. See if there's anything that always needs to stay, like the critical blocker, for instance. That's mm -hmm. just going to stay. And then the team has already built the framework for maybe we just iterate and up the ante on this one. Do we have anything that relates to the previous one? And so this document becomes, all right, we're iterating, we're growing, and eventually, hopefully by milestone, what is it, five or whatever, we're ready to go. So building blocks. I don't even need these tabs yet. Don't even get worried about it. <laughs> when it matters, it matters, mm -hmm. right? And so we may actually have a tab for launch already because we know we want to hit 60 frames per second, blah, 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 right. blah, 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 blah. Right. Like if we know those things, that's fine. Go ahead and list them. No problem. But if we don't, don't stress about it. Don't get there. Iterate as you get there. And that's it. You've seen it all. That's good. I mean, what you've done is made it seem achievable. <laughs> so I like I like how this kind of this kind of rolls into uh, what I wanted to uh, discuss a little bit at the end here was how what's QA's role in elevating the practice of creating and curating these quality bars. And I think you've shown a really good example. Like, okay, here's the sheet I'm going to keep track of. Here are the areas that everyone on our team owns and it's color coded so you can find it. I need you to keep track of this and keep updated with it. Keep make sure everyone's in the loop. So that way I can make sure that everyone is going by these quality bars and that if there are any problems or inconsistencies, we can reassess and adjust them as needed. Yeah. Our go no goes become about going through that list. Mm -hmm. We have those 22% of blockers or fails. So our producers are going to be chasing those down. We're going to be helping them chase those down. Right. Those have become the things. The 5% that aren't completed yet, we chase those down. And then when all of that is in an acceptable place, then we're a go. So let me be very clear. Mm -hmm. You may have a fail that our production team may then change, like the team itself may change the quality bar on, right? We didn't, yep. we said we wanted to hit 60, we but go. we're actually going to go with 40. Okay. You aren't the owner of that though. You have had the conversation. You've presented the risk. I just want to be very clear that it is okay that quality bars change. If you feel very strongly, then stand up for it. But if you don't have this document, if you don't have these ways to facilitate this conversation, then it's always going to be okay to shift. No one actually sees the change happening. Mm. So this is a way for us to facilitate that. The other thing is, Go, no, go meetings then become about dependencies and external teams saying that they're okay for us to go. We've done our due diligence. Is our service team ready that may not be a part of this process? Is, is marketing ready that may not have been a part of this process? So go, no, go has become kind of different. We don't have to shift to going through line by line of everything. Mm -hmm. We can really shift to having a big meta conversation. Is the player ready for this experience? Is the company ready for this experience? We think so, or we don't. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. Like the, the go don't go meetings are different, and, and and when you said that, I heard they're effective. They're actual go don't go meetings. Mm. You're, 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 <laughs> you're 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 reaching a decision as a team and as a company that we're willing to put this product out, bring this product to life, even, uh, and that we've done this as a team. And so so. I love the amount of coaching that goes into this. Um, so if you're if you're wondering, um, if you're still wondering how expansive the quality discipline is, this is coaching. This is leadership at the highest levels of the organization. This is bringing everyone together to bring a product to life. The the, the when you do this well, at least when I've done this type of thing well, I never get that question: Why wasn't this caught in test? I'm sitting, I'm literally standing next to the product manager or the producer or the channel manager. Mm -hmm. And the, the entire board of VPs is asking, why is our critical service down? And I'm literally standing next to the product person. And I'm saying, we believe that we have the right things going in. 
we made these mistakes and mm-hmm. we will correct it. Like, like it is a we thing, people. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like this is we. this what it means. Yep. This is what it means to bring a product to life that we believe in, uh, and that we've done what we can to to make it right. Yep. And you're bringing in the entire team to own the quality of the product. It's not just on QA. It's the entire team. We all want this to be a really good quality, as clean as we can get it for our our customers, our players. Yeah. We all own this thing. We all Mm -hmm. own this thing. Like, like if I, if I happen to be spending some time with the designers and something doesn't look right, I I, I can have my say in design too. Cause I'm trying to bring this product to life. Mm -hmm. Like, like it's so much, it's so much, it's amazing when you have a great team and you're all like, it's like a a team of 10 people, but there are actually 10 minds working on the solution. Yeah. Um, Meta again, but I think I think when you are working in environments and you get to experience that, like mm-hmm. those people become your best friends. <laughs> no, that's real. <laughs> Magically, that happens. Uh, yep. You know, you begin understanding uh, what developers need or software engineers need. You begin understanding what what designers need. You begin understanding, and that understanding creates really, really strong. Uh, again, dope teams that can do mm-hmm. these things, that can mm-hmm. build these communities. Absolutely. All right. Anyone else with some with some final thoughts? I don't know. Y'all covered it so well. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Wow. That was an excellent journey. Thank you, Chelsea, for bringing us through another fantastic slide presentation. Really appreciate I'm that. sorry. My goodness, please. <laughs> Don't Sorry for what? Why? <laughs> Sorry. Why are you apologizing? <laughs> no, that's no excellent. one wants to read slides on weekends. No, we I don't have disagree. to because yeah, I'd so much these... rather read slides than like I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, more boring like text document or something. You like are that. Your you slides are, are beautiful. They are gorgeous, and if anything, I think <laughs> you're pushing me even further into wanting to do this for my test plans. Like you're really selling it by the, with these presentations. And I Yay! love it. Thank you. This is so good. <laughs> I tend to do a lot of yeah. presentations like when I first start at a company and mm-hmm. then like I, I, I kind of lose the reason to later on because mm-hmm. uh, just not needing to like do a lot of here's this thing that I need. Everyone's kind of buy in on. But, you know, presentations are much more fun than than documents are. I'm agreed. Absolutely. Agree. All right. Hashtag schooled and I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love I love this entire conversation. Mm-hmm. Um there's something that that's special and magical that happens when you when you when you agree philosophically on on what should happen you have a sense you have a muscle memory for it and then you see it elaborated on by a colleague and you see things that you can add or things that you can bring into your own practice or like you think of conversations that you're going to have on monday with people outside of quality when you see a presentation like this and how it can be brought together um Thank you. Thank you all for this. Yeah. Thank you for the conversation. No, this was great. All right. (laughs) It's time to bring this thing home, uh, wrap it up with a a bug of the cast. Um, I think I'm just going to bring out a bug that I've had sitting for about five years now. Uh, So this comes from Rock Band 4 development. So when you play Rock Band, Rock Band in general, and there's camera cuts and they go around and they they look at things that are going on on the stage. You can see the person that you, your avatar playing, playing on drums and all that fun stuff. And you can see the crowd doing fun things, right? One day we found a bug where there was a camera cut and we had it set up. So that way someone could get up on stage and leap on, into the crowd and crowd surf a little bit. Cool. looked fun. Um, and it looked great in the smaller venues. It looked really cool. But there was a bug one day where there was a larger venue was brought in and it's like, cool, we're going to start testing venues. And when it got to this specific camera cut animation, the person climbed up into the rafters of an extremely large, like tall open area venue, like very big, like almost an arena up onto the rafters and the camera's like looking up and zooming in and they just leap a good like three stories down onto the crowd. (laughs) And it was just like, just like this real quick. You just see this person up in the rafters go like, yeah. And then it cuts to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> it was, just, was a little too high. 
<laughs> it was just the most incredible thing to see. And we were just crying because it just looked insane. Uh, it, it's such a, a minor bug and it was a quick fix, but it was just seeing this was just, oh. That is absolutely yes, a feature. Please, man. That's a sometimes feature. <laughs> the most minor bugs are the most memorable. Uh, just just because mm -hmm. of like how fun they are. Like at the end of and at the end of the day, if you know if you left it in the game, probably wouldn't really matter or bother anyone. No, right? no, it would. <laughs> it would just look insane. So <laughs> I insane. I definitely get a little sad sometimes when those bugs get fixed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. All right, so. I'm going to wrap this up. So that's it for today, everybody. I want to thank uh, Chelsea for the presentation and for Myron and for Ariel for joining in on the conversation and for all of you for joining us today. Um, we couldn't do this without you, without being here to support and give us some cool ideas to help further this conversation of quality in our industry. Um, if you have any other ideas for a podcast or topics we should talk about or uh, if you'd like to come on and speak with us, uh, feel, free, feel free to please uh, contact us at undergroundgameqaconf at gmail.com or you can reach out to us on Twitter at undergroundqa because we would absolutely love to hear from you and we'd love please, to collaborate please, with you. Please. So before we wrap up, does anybody have any plugs? I sure do. Oh, Chelsea. Today, my plug is about an amazing game that I discovered on Steam recently. It just came out. It is called Spirit Fair, and you should play it. It is a really quite a amazing uh, story. It's got incredible hand drawn graphics. I really believe that it is something special, and it is done by. Thunder Lotus Games. It just came out on the 18th, so it's really new. And uh, check it out. Check it out on Steam. I believe it's coming to Switch as well. Um, but it is super worth, super lighthearted with a very heavy topic. Oh, um, wow. So uh, check it out. My other tag is Finnish, Finnish Ghosts of Tsushima, if you haven't. It's a great game. Working and on it. <laughs> music, uh, graphics, everything. So thankful to to the dev team for creating a great project like that. Music. It is beautiful. Music. It's gorgeous. I love listening to it. Uh, yeah. Ariel, you've got anything? Uh, nope. No plugs this week. That's all right. Myron? Uh, on the game front, I've been addicted to Pathfinder Kingmaker. I have about 200 hours on it. I've only been playing for like three weeks. Um, so it is an amazing game. They just had a turn-based uh, update to it. Uh, if you like computer RPGs, if you like D&D uh, 3.5, 3 3.0, Pathfinder 1st uh, Edition, uh, or D&D 5th Edition, or frankly, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, uh, this game, you'll love it. Alcat Games, Paizo, uh, and uh, Deep Silver, I believe. They had an ambitious goal of recreating the pen and paper uh, game in the computer form, and I think they've nailed it. Um, so that's that's the, that's my recommendation. Pathfinder awesome. Kingmaker. Awesome. Also, if you like pina coladas, Ooh. you'd like that game. And getting caught in the rain. Hey. <laughs> if you're not into, I'm, I'm into it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll do a quick uh, shout out and plug. There's quite the, the discourse going on in the D&D community right now, but I would like to give a shout out to at Mustang Art, Mustangs Art, excuse me, um, for creating the uh, combat wheelchair in for D&D 5th edition. Those, and just oh my pushing gosh. the conversation for um, uh, uh, more inclusion in D&D and building characters and the idea of it and the rules behind it and some of the art that's come from it, including the, the many figures. Yeah. Oh, it's so cool. It's friggin' awesome. And I want to start including it in the campaigns that I run. So uh shout out to shout out to her for, for that. Awesome. All right. Well, with that, uh thanks again everyone for joining us. Uh we love you all. And yeah. remember to keep playing, keep testing, wear a mask, and keep washing your hands. Please wash your hands. <laughs> wash your goddamn hands. <laughs> wash your mask too. Ooh, yep. Do it. Uh, Infect everything. <laughs>